Right, let's go. Welcome to the latest episode of The Biofiles with myself, Edward, Jack and Dids. And uh, this is a podcast where we kind of take you through some interesting stories and science which we think you want to hear about, but most of us a chance where we chat about these things and uh, maybe make it interesting for you as well. So without further ado, um, Dids, do you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. I am actually prepared this week with some, <laughs> with a few articles and a few linking passages indeed. Um <laughs> So this one's actually quite topical because one of us on in, in the biofiles was an avid addict at uni of energy drinks. <laughs> and a large component of energy drinks is taurine, which is always discussed. But apparently local uh, recent studies, sorry, have shown that taurine supplement supplementation can apparently make animals live longer. So this has been shown in uh, worms. So applicable to you, Jack. Um, it's been shown also in, let me get the right species, worms, mice, and also the rhesus monkey. So pretty similar to humans. And we've, and we've seen the same results in all three. In 15-year-old monkeys, they had 85% less taurine in their blood than did five-year-old monkeys. That's not suggestive of them living longer, though. No, no, no. This is this is when they're like older. So like, oh, when taurine is naturally occurring amino acid anyway in the body, and fifteen-year-old monkeys have been have been found to have eighty-five percent less taurine measurable uh, than like five-year-old monkeys. So I think that's adolescence in monkey life. I think, um, but basically older and younger, and as you, as they get older, the taurine in their blood decreases, um, and then with daily dosing of taurine, um, they found that. So this is now a study in mice. They saw a 12 and a 10% respective increase in lifespan between the uh, females and males uh, compared to the controls. So so daily dosing the male monkeys um, (laughs) increased their lifespan by 12%. Uh, No, so so daily dosing has increased it in the mice. In the monkeys, uh, I didn't read the uh, paper on the monkeys, just read the summary on it. Um, But it's all basically citing the same data sets. Uh, and they're all supportive of each other. They think it's something to do with antioxidant properties and um, defense against ROS, reactive oxygen species. And it's to do with telomere protection, which I think ah. we've spoke about that before, haven't we, on this? I reckon let's go into it again. Yeah, Jack, you're a telomere guy. You wrote a paper on anti-aging, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. I think our uh, topics are going to overlap slightly, actually. Um, are you talking about that too? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the telomeres telomere lengthening they always used to think that was like the way we would end up making ourselves immortal was um for those of you that don't know telomeres are uh sequences of dna on the end of your chromosomes which protect them from dna damage um and they get shorter as you get older they sort of get degraded over time they're often linked with you know dna damage which which can cause all types of different diseases and, um, after after a certain point, you run out of that telomere and it starts degrading the actual chromosome, doesn't it? When you start yeah. losing actual genetic material, and that's when you start to see damage yeah. or aging or whatever is what they think. Yeah, and like if if your body cells detect that uh, your your cells are undergoing this kind of damage, they'll just kill them. Uh, which you know that's partly what leads to uh, you know your muscles getting weaker and stuff as you get old because your cells are coming to end of life and you're your body's just breaking them down because it knows they're getting old and sick and gross. Um, so is, it, is that a sorry. hypothesis, Dids? Is that um, they think that it it is interacting with telomeres and protecting them, or have they actually got data to show that it is kind of pre- pre- preventing the telomeres from getting degraded as quickly? Um, so they do have data on taurine's effect on cell, or like efficacy as a protect as a protector for at the cellular level. So they've done tests in cells to see how taurine affects kind of resistance of cells to stresses and stuff like that. Uh, and they and they've used, as I say, they've used it as an antioxidant. Um, they found that taurine can stabilize membranes, scavenge reactive oxygen species, and also decrease peroxidation um, in unsaturated membrane membrane lipids. So basically, just um, helps to resist challenge on the in the cells at like a intracellular level. Which is really cool because you think, oh, I'm just drinking this energy drink just to like get a quick buzz. <laughs> but um, they also found like benefits 
uh, from taurine, or at least taurine added to taurine supplementation, they found increased muscle endurance, increased strength. In females, they found that it decreased depression, uh, sorry, depression associated behavior uh, and anxiety, and also like increased their immune system functioning. So all of these are like longevity markers in a way, aren't they? Like if your immune system is going to decrease, you're probably going to die quicker. Increase in male endurance, uh, physical endurance. Um, you know, that's all beneficial for survival, especially out in the wild and strength. That's all beneficial, for especially reproductive stuff like that. So, yeah, it's pretty any, cool. Um, are there any natural sources of taurine? Like can can animals in, in the wild be eating, I don't know, more mangoes and therefore are likely to live slightly longer? That's a great question. You know? let, me, let me have a quick. Jamie, pull that up. Uh, <laughs> just pull it up. Uh, seafood. <laughs> Did you actually? Uh, yeah, yeah. Scallops, uh, tuna, octopus, turkey, seaweed. Chefs? Beef. No way. <laughs> yeah, we Chefs can the answer to all everything. <laughs> tune in next week, guys. I mean, not next week, we don't do this weekly at all. But tune in for the next episode where it'll be primarily, actually solely on cephalopods. Um, Is that the big episode yeah, five? That's big episode five coming up next. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to take at least a year to curate all the uh, yeah. info. <laughs> <laughs> Do we, yeah, um... Just quickly, just want to summarize, finish my point, right? Because this is what, this is what I find really quite funny about it. Is that, so I've just described increased muscle endurance, strength, decreased depression uh, and anxiety and increased immune system, right? Apparently, apparently, according to Nature Briefing's summary of this data, and I haven't gone back and read all the sources that they're referring to here, but they've seen the similar or the same positive effects in rhesus monkeys and also worms. And I just want to say, like, how do you calculate muscle endurance strength or signs of depression or immune system functioning in a worm I, just, that's just a point to consider you are, you <laughs> ask you ask the worm how are you feeling today hey buddy how you doing how um they weren't they weren't injecting them with they were energy drink were they they were no no like, with taurine with, with pure taurine not not energy drinks from taurine. iv i believe it was iv taurine and then uh <clears throat> there you go but it was seen to be at um like really high doses. So they're not sure if those doses would be either physiologically achievable in a human because just the amount you'd have to like drink uh, unless you want to take an injection of taurine, which not many people would want to do. Um, but they also, but it, they did say that it would be below the European Food Safety Authority, which is like the European version of the FSA for us, the Food Safety Association. People who keep things that are edible safe for us. They regulate that. Uh, they did say that the taurine levels would be below EFSA's like, tolerable daily intake level. So you would survive it on EFSA's opinion, but it would be difficult to achieve that kind of level, I think, for the benefits that are seen. So yeah. do, you I think it would have, um, do you reckon it would have more detrimental like impacts elsewhere? Like, I don't know, destroy your gut microbiota i mean probably yeah <laughs> like the um if you're gonna if we're gonna be talking energy drinks they they quoted that it's like uh you need six energy drinks to get the to get the necessary level of taurine in your blood and i've done two energy drinks and i've been uncomfortable so just <laughs> purely because of the amount of caffeine and sugar and stuff that you get alongside it so unless you get like a pure taurine drink i don't know i think it'd be difficult to do but it's interesting science. So it is interesting science. Have they um have they hypothesized, yeah, that those who do take energy drinks might be slightly uh more likely to die. I don't want to make that <laughs> a health recommendation. But the positives are apparently there. The science is apparently there. That a constituent of the energy drinks does improve depression symptoms, it does make you stronger, it does make you endure for longer so you know and apparently that happens at a cellular level as well there is there is a lot of evidence actually it's from like 2001 it's found one of the one, one paper that went, went right back to 2001 another paper right the way up to 2017 so it seems to be an ongoing area of research interesting Did they mention yeah. any future uh future trials or anything which is planned oh, I, don't already? I think i think i think it's just there's so much to look at we, we know so little about the body really uh, and even the most explored chemicals there's a lot of unknowns so they've just i don't know i couldn't tell you they're probably looking at everything one study did show that it had increased uh, uh glutathione you know what glutathione is um it's, it's one of those ones you hear a lot but yeah it's like a natural antioxidant that we have in the body it protect again it protects against reactive oxygen species and stuff and glutathione is one of the things is one of the compounds that help to neutralize the um 
well, you're going to have to fact check me here. I'm pretty sure it's right. But it, glutathione is one of the um, antioxidants that help to neutralize the toxic metabolite of paracetamol, NAPKI. And I'm not mm-hmm. going to say what NAPKI is because it's a very long word. So I always like to go into the um, why biological things are called, what they're called sort of thing, the etymology of, of things. So taurine, and we think and that's kind of related to taurus, which is uh, to do with bulls. And we all know what the relationship between bulls and energy drinks are. So I don't need to go any further than that. Bull fan. I just wanted to link this to this because it was talking about telomeres. Um, there was a, there's an intro, I don't know if you guys have seen, you must have seen it recently. There's a guy who has been reported, he's like an ex-Navy officer from the United States, has gone, decided to spend 92 days, I think it is, 93 days underwater at depth to uh, basically assess the effects that deep water or just pressure has on the human body for a long period of time. The studies are going to start helping for like uh, looking at the physiological effects of going to Mars and like deep space travel and stuff like that. And, uh, And it turns out, that he apparently saw, has seen since coming back up, he's seen a 20% growth of his telomere length since before going into the um, growth. Pond. Yeah, yeah, oh, growth. So it, yeah. So I, I saw something when I was researching for this um, that a lot of the pathways that they think are related, that they're looking at for like potential anti aging treatments, are related to um, sort of environmental hardship. So stuff like intermittent fasting being subjected to cold temperatures for a long amount of time i think as well stuff like being at altitude like not having much access to uh, oxygen stuff like that apparently activates these pathways and yeah could potentially be doing some like telomere lengthening or something i read a similar thing it wouldn't yeah. surprise me but it would surprise me but like apparently external threats uh, external stresses promote the stability of your genome yeah i heard your your cells start, or I heard, right? I was reading about your cells start to go into a bit of like a shock response almost and a con- like conservative response where they're thinking, let's not divide rapidly and create senescent cells, which are the cells which don't continue dividing, they can still kind of function. They pause, don't they? They're still alive. They're just, yeah. they're senescent. They're, they don't, they function, but they don't divide. They don't go through their mitosis, which is yeah. really, which to be fair, it makes sense because that's a very metabolically demanding process. And they're also, they're probably pretty vulnerable at that point. When they've got all this, when they're trying to duplicate the right amount of DNA, at, at some point there's going to be the wrong. Well, for ninety percent of the time, there's a the wrong number of DNA in that cell until it gets to double, and then they split. So I know that's right. With with entering senescence, and you wouldn't be, yeah, taking up that metabolic um, mm. fee, and therefore you're conserving the energy which you have. So in the stress situation, you can focus on overcoming that stress. So it's it's yeah. weird, isn't it? So. We, I wonder how that's going to be implemented or if that's going to be implemented later in life. If, if you, just go home, fad. you go home and you're like, your pressure's actually, I don't know, what, three bar in your home or I don't know, 5G. <laughs> right, well, we, all, we all live in like those dive bells where they used to blow up goats. <laughs> what? We all live... do, you know, do you not know about that? No. That's another thing. This guy's seen apparently increased muscle density and, um, and he's got leaner. His, met- his metabolism's increased. And so he's burnt fat and he's come out leaner. He are was these, doing like... Are these scientific, like, is this coming from an article or is this just coming from his Instagram page? Because I don't know how no, much no. we can, no, we this can is talk like, about this... Instagram as a, as a primary source of information. No, no, so this, it's a genuine study that they've done out of the University of um, somewhere in Spain, I think it is. Uh, but are these, are, are these the gen... Have they published yet, or is this just nah, like nah, a preview? Nah, not yet. There? Well, I, I don't know. I haven't found the paper. Did, you um, can't, you can't bring non-published data to the table. No, I just wanted it, to talk it? about <laughs> it. I just wanted to talk about. It. As I said, just to do a little round robin, you know, I was just bringing out the whole telomere. He was talking about telomere length increasing. I'm just quoting it, but um, I think it I guess was, the paper t- will be topical. Soon. It'll be topical. Okay, well, um, maybe we'll do an update on that. He is a doctor. Okay. I'll that find it. A bit but... of credence. <laughs> let me let me let me find. I'm trying to find the paper. Uh, anyway, I think we should. Um, I think we should move on as we're move on. Yeah, run out of time a bit. So, yeah, yeah. Jack, as your as yours related, do you want to go on to? Yeah, yeah, it's probably best because it's pretty pretty simple actually. Um, so yeah, my one is sort of an even more disgusting way of making yourself immortal than drinking any drinks. Um, which is, I don't know if you've seen this in the news, there's tech bros out in Silicon Valley 
who are um, getting transfusions for it's eight thousand dollars a liter. You can buy a liter of blood from someone who's sixteen to twenty five, so young, and then um, get that transfused into you for various proposed health benefits and you know making you younger making you know your brain work better your muscles grow quicker stuff like that um and yeah i'd I'd seen like a few articles on this like saying oh this got more money than sense blah 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 like what the hell they doing like it's almost vampire like um but i I looked into it a bit more and it was kind of related to some to a, a little paper i did in second year um, where they did this thing called parabiosis, which is where you they sewed two mice together, like Siamese twins, so that they shared a circulatory system. Wow. Uh, it's a bit like, yeah, what's it called? The human caterpillar? Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> human centipede. Human centipede. <laughs> it's kind of like that, where, yeah, they, they sewed these two mice together. One of them's like, old like it was the equivalent of about 60 years old in human years and one of them was young and um yeah they found like all those health benefits that you're talking about really about like um be able to not just slow down aging actually but actually rejuvenate their cells make their skin cells uh produce cell signals which are more youthful make the skin appear more youthful um same for regrowing muscle uh, tissue brain tissue as well they had a really interesting study, which could be really exciting for like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and stuff, um, where they taught a maze. They, they, they taught these two mice the same age um, how to do a maze. And then as they got older, one of them hadn't been receiving any treatment, slowly started to like forget how to do the maze uh, just because he was getting old. But the one who had been injected with human young blood, young blood, uh yeah he was he was able to remember like well into his old age how to do this maze so it suggested that somehow there's some facts in the blood that they haven't nailed down quite yet but there's some factors in the blood which seem to be able to promote youthful cell behavior um interesting do you reckon it's kind of like hormones and these old cells are getting kind of um their receptors on the cell surface these things which kind of record or can detect things flowing around the body are detecting these young signals from the young mice which then cause them to have a, a change in their dna or not dna but a change in how they're utilizing their dna and the gene expression which is more representative of being young then yeah yeah so initially they when they were sewing the little mice together they were literally like you know if they were if they were doing an experiment on the liver they would sew the two li- livers together so that they were like directly contacting each other um but then they changed it so that they were just sharing the blood they're sharing a circulatory system so they have the same blood pumping around their bodies um and then that's when they realized oh it must be like factors in the blood so yeah they think it's some kind of hormone or protein or something um Weird. they've they've got like a few candidates where they think it's due to like stem cells um it's there's there are some proteins which uh um have you ever heard of the yam yam yamanaka uh factors or something no no um <laughs> it's it's like a back in like the 2000s or whenever it was uh when they were able to turn adult cells into stem cells um it, oh the reprogramming used, stuff yeah reprogramming making uh ipscs um, yeah uh yeah it, those factors which are used to sort of create that turn them back in stem cells it's that kind of um that kind of pathway they think is related to it wow That's i do cool. think it's crazy when um there there are quite a few studies where they put kind of healthy matter into either old or unhealthy kind of um other, other organisms with the same species and stuff they just well, usually mice actually they do just find that the the older or the unhealthy ones start to revert back to how the younger or the, the healthier sample is. Like you see it with um with like the gut microbiota. I think in mice they put gut microbiota from non-depressed mice into depressed mice. And like the depressed mice then started showing some non-depressive traits and seem to that's breaking news as well. Um, yes, I didn't think you did that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which uh I, yeah I do just think it's crazy and I I hadn't realised that it was going on with with the study with the mice where they put in just two together with the circulatory system did they try just injecting the blood into the mouse rather than um 
sewing them together? Like, was the sewing together necessary? Yeah, I, I, I don't know why they went with that approach first, to be honest with you. Yeah, it seemed a bit overkill. Um, yeah, I think initially they were doing that, um, I guess, because it was a longer term study. So they needed to be sharing the same circulatory system for a few days or weeks or something. I can't remember how long it was. How um, did they get but, around the rejection stuff? I think they were like brothers or something, or I think they were related. Um, uh. So there was less chance of rejection and they're on immunosuppressants as well um, all right but yeah oh. um and so some people have taken this very literally and have started doing it themselves yeah in... there's like a few startups in silicon valley now i was looking yesterday there's literally like half a dozen i think um some of them were actually trying to get to the bottom of like what protein or hormone whatever is causing this so that they can you know turn it into a drug that they can get through the fda the proper way and get it you know, if if it turns out it works and it gets through the FDA, then they can start making money off it. So how how they're doing at the moment? Yeah. It hasn't been passed by the FDA, is it? It's just black market sort of thing. Not if black saying, market. If you're saying Silicon Valley, then it must be like public publicly accessible. It's like um, voluntary uh, clinical trials, basically. Um, but even those need to, need to go through approval before being made into a clinical trial. Like you can't yeah. just say, "I'm starting a clinical trial, join." You have well, to. You have to apply for them, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they are doing it through the FDA. But then there are some, like the ones, you know, I've been seeing these articles where they are literally, they're like, eh, we can't be bothered doing all that science stuff. And they're just, because it, it's, a, it's legal to give people transfusions, right? Like you can, just, mm. you, you can give people a litre or two of blood. Like there's nothing against the law about that. Just I don't know, it does, it for... could, could you... Could you just inject your... I don't feel you could do that in England. I feel like you'd have to kind of have, can. Like, no, be licensed you, you, sort of thing. You if get it's private, yeah. People do it um, in endurance events. People, Well, they used to before it was banned. Uh, it's called something. It, EPO? Basically, like yeah, doping? EPO stuff. Yeah, they go and train up at altitude and then they take some samples of blood at altitude, which is obviously like really dense with red blood cells and high in EPO. And then they come back down, they refrigerate it. And then when it comes to like race week, they start to pump themselves full of like a extra blood and b extra blood, which is full of extra red blood cells. They get the performance benefit. You can do it; it's legal. It's just against the sports rules. It's uh, I do think that sort of thing's ridiculous. It just shows how how far athletes can go or will go to to win gold, sort of thing. I think it's incredible. I think it's incredible that you can like hack the body like that not hack the body it's not a hack at all it's just like capitalize on the body's adaptations because you don't need to you don't need to spend that long at altitude to see the benefits yeah I think it's like two weeks two weeks isn't a very long time really did you hear about when um with the story with lance armstrong don't want to get confused with he's the, the yeah cyclist. he's a cyclist yeah, yeah, yeah the he didn't one. didn't go to the moon so he was um <laughs> <laughs> he was taking so many um Oh, the the doping drugs that he was taking caused like such an effect to his his blood cells. So it's making his blood really thick, and I think because he, it was just so dense with blood cells, it was kind of yeah. not gloopy, but um, the fact Sludge. that you'd have to wake up in the middle of the night to go cycling so that he wouldn't die. Otherwise, apparently his um his veins would just kind of burst because they would get so saturated with with this gloopy blood which wasn't moving. Um, he had to kind of get his heart rate up so that it would start flushing around the system. Really? It yeah, it wouldn't coagulate. Which I don't know. Again, this isn't. I haven't read that from this, but uh, that's, that's a story which I've heard, which you just think is insane if you're willing to go that mm. that level of uh, training. Yeah. To... I mean, I've never understood how they don't pop like putting in extra liters like that because they they put in like a few pints. I think it's like two a pint, two pints. Like, yeah, that's, the, a, that's a lot of extra blood. What's the max? What's, I wonder what the maximum amount of blood a human can have because you know that you can't like lose more than X amount of pints. Are, are we eight pints? Oh, I looked human... it up the other day yeah. talking to you, Jack, about. Um, <laughs> oh. You guys got a, a side podcast without without. Me? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't podcast worthy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Average adult has five liters of blood circulating around their body. Uh, we're actually an imperial system. So can we go back to pints? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's about double that. It's just just over double that. So it's like 11, 12 pints. I don't think that's the right conversion, is it? It's 560 something mil in a pint. 568 in a pint. So it'd be less than double. So it'd be like nine pints. <laughs> <laughs>
Ish. No. <laughs> <laughs> we got calculators and things for that. Um, yeah. You, you, yeah. Oh, what? I saw some. It's. I saw something the other day where this bloke um, was in some kind of car accident or something. He lost so much blood that they literally there wasn't enough to go around basically. So to keep his brain alive, they pumped his brain full of uh, saline solution at ten degrees, basically putting his brain on ice. What? Um, to just to keep him alive long enough to like stitch him back up and get some blood into him. Oh, that's disgusting. But yeah, they literally like put his brain on ice until they could actually hook it up to a proper like functioning circulatory system again. Medicine's just barbaric, isn't it? It's like <laughs> yeah, yeah we just put him on ice, like some fish that we just caught from the <laughs> sea, and it'll be all right when we like want to open it back up. Apparently, humans can lose fourteen percent of their total blood. Let's do, let's do a stop code on. Let's do a stop code on. What, this is a stop code on. This is a stop code on, yeah. As a percentage, how much blood volume do you think you can lose before death or well, yeah, before death? Sixty percent. Sixty percent. Six. Very optimistic. You reckon you can lose yeah. over half your blood? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> reckon I could. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone could, I could. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go for forty percent. Forty percent. Yeah, that's your final locked in answers. That's my final locked in answer. Yeah, losing forty percent or more of your blood volume will usually lead to death without immediate and aggressive life saving measures. Wow. Should obviously include uh, pumping cool blood. saline in your brain. <laughs> losing thirty percent of your blood can lead to death without fluid replenishment with saline solution, lactated ringers solution, or a blood transfusion. Lactated ringer solution, did you say? Yeah, never heard of that before. <laughs> so if you're if you're a ringer, <laughs> then just lactate. You, you lactate it. <laughs> <laughs> you can cure cure millions. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack, sorry, going back to what you said earlier, did you say the guy's brain got pumped with saline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They so literally just, just as why like surely you need to do it for each of the organs, otherwise they're going to shut down. Um, I think where his heart had already stopped, um, so like that basically his body didn't, your, your body can survive, like the cells in your body can actually survive like a decent amount of time. I don't know exactly, but I'd imagine yeah. like a few minutes, yeah, like without any oxygen supply. So like his body was fine. It was just keeping his brain alive so yeah. that there was actually a person to bring yeah. back from the dead. I guess you can, um, you can transplant organs, but you can't really transplant your brain. Can you? Which yeah. Also an organ, no. But... Um, but also, like, we deal with your, the rest of your body deals with, like, massive stress all the time, like lactic acid, that you drive in the pH down, um, it, extremes in temperature, dehydration, stuff like that. Whereas the brain is kind of kept up. It, the body, the whole body is to regulate the brain, isn't it, really? So the brain keeps everything going. The brain never doesn't really see it. The only thing it sees is a temperature spike. It never sees, it sees a drop in blood volume when you're exercising. It maintains the same amount of drug, blood volume. I don't believe lactic acid goes into the brain. I doubt it, but... No, I'd imagine not. But yeah, yeah I know, like, I can't remember what the number is, but it's ridiculous how low the tolerance is. Like, if, you're, if your mm. brain loses... I think it's glucose and oxygen. Like, it's something ridiculous. Like, 5%. If it's 5% what it needs to be, you go into a coma. That's which crazy. is ridiculous, like, how finely tuned it is and how, how mm. big the energy requirement is. God. Well, anyway, I think we should uh, should move on unless there's anything final you want to say. Ah, well, that was interesting. In which case, uh, we shall move on to, to my one. This, uh, this, this podcast is going to talk about eDNA. And um, the reason I've, I've, this is of interest at the moment is because a study has recently found that Air filters, which are being used to track air quality in different locations, um, have been found to actually contain a lot of DNA on them, which is kind of just floating around in the air called environmental DNA. And um, kind of the ecologists who are interested in, in tracking DNA in these different places have kind of showed how how DNA can be extracted from these and how they can be used to monitor um, environments and the local environment as a tool to 
kind of assess like diversity and I mean if you know if you know the DNA which is out there, which we're gonna go into in a bit, you can get a whole host of, of different information there. So I thought it'd be um good just to talk a, a, just quickly about DNA. Just um you've probably heard of it, made of four different four different bases, deoxyribose, nucleic acid is its full name. And um DNA is kind of the sequence in your body which makes up your your genes and it's what's read and kind of leads to it's crazy how DNA leads to us being who we are. eDNA is classed as any DNA which is in the environment but not from it like as part of an organism. So say when you lose some hair, your hair is going to have a bit of DNA on it. Um, some cells can just slow, slow off, slough off. I don't quite know how you say that, but it's disgusting. Slough off. And that is a, a big insult because slough is, is disgusting. Quite, quite a dump. Pretty rough place. <laughs> If you're listening from Slough, just turn off now because we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that. Um, anyway, yeah. So things like saliva, um, poo, like there's lots of different ways that environmental or DNA can can enter the environment. And what what they do is they they extract this DNA from these filters or or from their sample. And it's a really interesting bit of technology which they they use to identify then what's going on. So first of all, because it's in such low concentrations, because you can't see DNA floating through the air, you can't see it in a sample. You have to really um, duplicate it loads of times and replicate it, which is usually done by the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. If you recognise that, as it as it quite popped up in COVID quite a bit, um, and they they use bits of dna which they've developed which can recognize sequences which they know are part of different genomes so the human genome is going to have sequences which are the same between everyone in in that from in humans and different species will have dna which is kind of um characteristic of that species and you can see it in each of these species because those regions are conserved so they um they use these primers which which recognize these they're called primers these small small fragments of that um they're made DNA and that kind of attaches to the environmental DNA and makes it up using a process um, with DNA primulase. They then can replicate that loads of times. And from there, they shove it through a uh, system which can, can then read these different kind of um, DNA fragments which they have. And they use databases which are um, curated. So when you sequence, say, a human being, then you can add that to a bit database and then you can search your DNA fragment against that human being's DNA fragment. You can see if your DNA is from them or if it's from, say, an elephant, if an elephant's uh, DNA has been sequenced. So from this, they can work out kind of all the different species which are in a environmental DNA sample, um, which is very good for diversity and kind of for detecting where, um, say, animals which are difficult to spot. So one of the, the key examples which they use are kind of lynxes in the um, Arctic. So Arctic lynxes are pretty elusive and difficult to find. And you can see their footprints, but even those are pretty difficult to tell if they are from a lynx or from a different cat. But then you can pick up the snow, which the lynx footprint is in, and then sequence this eDNA and see that, yeah, that is a lynx which we've got there. And um, it's a very non-invasive way of kind of detecting habitats. That's sick. Which is really cool. So... Because they used to like try and rely on scat, try and find p- actual droppings, poo, and then you'd have to analyze the poo and then be like, oh yeah, that's a com- confirmation of a species in there if you didn't have a sighting. Yes, that would be one way. It would be sightings. It would be kind of putting cameras up. Oh, well, I guess that's sightings as well. And um, maybe looking for carcasses sorts of things. And yeah, it just means it's a lot less invasive. So you don't actually need to go out and one, kind of pick up an animal and take a sample from it. You can just let it be and, and take its, its DNA. And it's, um, DNA isn't indestructible, so these things break down pretty quickly. So it's pretty um, accurate at showing what is in that specific like environment at that time. It's not to say there's not limitations, because of course you can get, um, it can travel through the air, so it might not be quite um, as temporal or spatial as, as you expect. But I think with the um, advent of this, I, it's kind of going to develop. So I think these, these sorts of questions of, all has this appeared here or has it traveled through the air you might be able to pick up by seeing how degraded it is or how much the dna there is one of the one of the applications this could be used for is identifying if the loch ness monster is real because obviously (laughs) that is a creature which is extremely hard to uh to cite no um i don't know we're saying no confirmed sightings are there any can you confirm a sighting i don't don't think so i mean he's the man the myth the legend isn't he so 
Is it even a he? Is it an it? Sorry, they. (laughs) Thank you for correcting me. They are the them, the myth, the legend. (laughs) You know, there are... I don't don't think there's, like, confirmed. There's just pictures of stuff. Mm. Like... So the, this scientist was like, so we we sequenced the um the Loch Ness. It was kind of just showcasing how it can like this is quite a powerful tool. So they were able to find all these different kind of fish and fish species which are in there. So they picked up um they took a sample of this Loch, uh, well sample of, of the the Loch Ness, and um like put it through a filter to to pick up these these DNA fragments and then yeah looked at all of these different uh. DNA fragments and we're able to find that there were eels in the Loch Ness. So who knows if it is just one massive eel, then it could the Loch Ness could be <laughs> could be in there. And the the, the um, researcher who did the study was saying, "I'm not saying that the Loch Ness wasn't in there because we can't be sure." But we you didn't can't find discount any, it. Uh, we can't discount. Fine, and also, fine. if the uh, if the Loch Ness has never never been sequenced itself, and you don't have a reference to uh, nope. to put it against, yeah, so you might, it. you might have some. Right some unknown DNA in there which you just can't but yeah so some cool cool applications of this is actually let's make this into a, a stop code on you know how with the permafrost freezing you hear of these stories of I think we talked about before anthrax coming out mm. and all these old populations coming through zombie and you know viruses. how zombie viruses and you know how um, geologists kind of look at the permafrost to see what the like geological scene was at the time and you can find preserved fossils down in um, different layers and because you know uh, geologists know by the number of layers or of certain mineral fragments like kind of the age of the um the earth at that point and you can get a pretty good like historical um time point for what that environment was at that time sort of thing so they've um they've been doing this with um environmental dna as well and they've been kind of going through different permafrost and different ice sheets and kind of seeing if they can sequence eDNA from there which has been frozen in it and this is more beneficial than just looking at fossils because you can't always find fossils but if eDNA is in there then that's a, a kind of even better marker of um mm. not even better obviously the fossil is the the actual marker but it's a pretty good representation that what species were there at that time so guess what the oldest um segment of DNA which has been sequenced from a permafrost um, has been how many how many years old was this piece of DNA? <sighs> Say, I don't know how old is how old is permafrost? Per- permafrost is like right the way down to the start of. I'm pretty sure that it goes right the way back to like the first living species. So I reckon, I reckon those little what are they call. Th- Thalassilomide boys, what are they called? Those little. Uh... <laughs> I think that's a drug. Thalidomide is the dangerous drug. Oh, yeah. I can also, swear the name. Also, treat leprosy as well. Yeah. <laughs> are you thinking of trilobites? No, what about those first, the first little. Um, the, the first little shelled organisms that look like the horseshoe crab, that like they were the first ones that were walking around the, the sea. Um, trilobite? Yeah, trilobites. Trilobite, yeah, I think it's called that. Is that what you said? So when I said trilobites, you said no. What are the, yeah, no, uh... you were wrong. <laughs> you were exact right. <laughs> I just wanted to hear it from somebody else. <laughs> wanted a second I'm, opinion. Yeah, I'm saying a trilobite. I'm saying 100 million years. No, no, I'm saying, th- I'm saying 900 million years. Nine. 900 million years for dead. Yeah, why not? Why not? Full I'm going to be very pessimistic compared to that. I'm going to say 1 million. Are those yeah, answers locked in? Locked. Was... Yeah, I'm locked in. What, 900 million? You think that we have, can dig so deep that we can get 900 <laughs> million years deep into the Earth? Like, uh, I read an article the other day that we've just hit the top of the mantle somewhere in the world, actually, with a drill. So, yeah, I do. Pretty sure the top of the mantle you can find in Cornwall as well. So, that's the... Um, no, that's the tectonic oh, plate. <laughs> <laughs> there, is some, there is some tectonic plate no, the cool. mantle is the lava. Yeah, but what, like, the lava then goes into the tectonic plates, isn't it? It's all linked. No, the tectonic plates are on top of the lava. Geography. The mantle, <laughs> yeah. the mantle is what moves the tectonic plates. The mantle is, flu- mantle is fluid. Sorry, is this called the geography file? <laughs> <laughs> 
the geo files. <laughs> oh, that, that sounds quite good. That's so yeah. I'm gonna anyway, break a podcast. Sounds like a geography teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Um, two million years. It's two million years uh, is the oldest so far piece of eDNA which they can find. So nowhere near nine hundred million. Jack, you're, oh, so it was a, it was you're a more million. conservative. T- it's two million. million. T- two million. million years oh. old is this, which is still incredible. Because if you think like DNA does degrade as well, these things break down. They think that this um, one that's kind of been frozen and that's that's helped it survive. But another another thing which they think's helped is kind of the minerals, and they think that the DNA might be able to bind to minerals and therefore be preserved and stuff. But from from this, they were able to find um, mastodons in in this area in Greenland. I should say it's this is in a Greenland um, Cap Cabenhaven formation, which is probably wrong. So if you're from Greenland and um, don't know, they speak Danish, write us in, write in, yeah, yeah. talk to us, tell your We'd friends like to, to listen to us. <laughs> I can tell you from my Spotify um, my Spotify facts of no. where our listeners are from. We don't have any in Greenland yet, so <laughs> please, please start listening. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they found those. So also two million years ago, apparently there were geese, which I thought were no didn't, way didn't that they survived geese... two million years. Well, they, not the same species; it'd be extinct species sort of thing. But that's that's something which is cool. Is it can look at these extinct species because, say, like a fossil of of this geese has been found before. You could um, you could like sequence the genome from the fossil because you know that, that DNA is from the geese, and then you then have that as a reference, and then any any further eDNA um, sequences you find are then. And then in geese. Well, two but, million years isn't that long in the in the scheme of like uh, like the permafrost and like was it anthrop not anthropology archaeology. Two million years isn't that isn't that deep? Yeah. So I I did search up how old is life, um, and the top coming from the Smithsonian, so quite a reputable source. It says about three point seven billion years old. So yeah, see, nine hundred the... million was not a bad estimate. Mm. Yeah, it still ruined my. Look, it hasn't been found yet. All on, look, in twenty years' time, when they find nine hundred million year old eDNA, I'm going to reshare this podcast on all of my new digital whatever, like fluorescent social medias, and I'm going to shout you out and say, "Look, I was right. <laughs> Give me that point." <laughs> well, we will retrospectively uh, mark it back in. Back in <laughs> <that>. <laughs> yeah. More to learn. Yeah, so much more to learn. Just a recent case study as well is. Whenever we, um, you might have heard over lockdown that they were tracking COVID through the sewage, and it was, um, it was a similar process. Instead of using DNA, they kind of use DNA's cousin RNA, which is found in viruses such as a COVID, COVID vaccine. Sorry, not vaccine, COVID virus. Um, and therefore, they were able to sample the sewage, um, check out what this this RNA is or what RNA presence in there, and kind of detect new new variants and what cities kind of have a have um the latest outbreaks and things which kind of just shows yeah. that this detecting the eDNA um in in the air could help track airborne pathogens and if you're tracking it in the soil it could help track pathogens kind of in any any particular environmental sub uh, sample which you have i'm pretty sure they used a similar tracking mechanism to find tb in the london sewers recently yeah, I saw that. Yeah, polio was it? Right, TB polio. Oh, let's, let's bring polio back to it as well, just because we always. I think every episode we've got the the, <laughs> the polio self disseminating vaccine uh, vaccine. In. Yeah, it's coming back to get us. <laughs> back, yeah, man, they're just evolving, trying to uh, get us somehow. But yeah, no, that uh, sewage monitoring is that is really insightful. Actually, um, you can you can find all sorts of information from looking at the sewage. It's uh, well, this this is a, a point which we shall we shall finish on is. The the ethical ethical sorry implications um, which comes with being able to sequence this DNA because if you can sequence a bit of DNA, say you're looking for human DNA in an air sample, you can then start to identify the individuals who are in there because, as we said, the sequences start off conserved but very quickly become um, very uh, a lot of variations occur within the genetic code which can then tell me and you apart. So um, people are saying is. It was like forensic evidence. We found eDNA in an air filter in the museum and we think you robbed this piece. Exactly, yeah, sort of thing. And, and then could it be used for more um, sinister sort of, of points? But as we've skirted around before in this podcast, we don't talk about the ethics. We let the uh, we let other people, <laughs> we let other people uh, come up with their conclusions for that. <laughs> and on that Go note. ahead with it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway yeah thank you very much for listening to this episode of the biofiles um 
we'll hopefully get the next episode out a bit more timely than when this one's come out. I haven't edited it yet, so it might be coming out in the next year, hopefully. And um, episode five is the next one. We've reached half half of ten. Five. <laughs> 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 and um, we agreed early on when creating this podcast that it would be a Cephalopod special. So there's lots of things which we are hoping to talk about in, in the next episode. So do be sure to tune in there. You can find us on Spotify, um, Apple Music, I think potentially on on iTunes. That would be Apple Music. You can find us on Amazon, YouTube as well. We're everywhere, almost everywhere. It depends if I can be bothered to set up different accounts for these things, which I'm slowly but surely doing. We actually also have a website called www.thebiofiles.co.uk, so be sure to check that out um, where you, you won't learn much, but it, it's a website which has been made, so go, go and get it. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much, Jack and Diz. 